you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And I think that what we started with was really a simplistic layout behind what we're going to do, but it was going to be incredibly detailed and we were going to teach, you know, our athletes, um, educationally, really how to take control over their own lifestyle, how to take control over their own technique and apply things, you know, I think across the board. You are listening to Coach Carlisle's Pursuit of Excellence podcast show, brought to you by Carlisle Performance Systems, located in San Jose, California. Episode number 15, titled, All About the Student Athlete, with Matt Shaw. Matt is in his seventh year at the University of Denver as a director of sports performance. He currently oversees the development of men's ice hockey, and by the way, they won a national championship in 2017, and men's soccer, They've been to the Final Four over the last couple years. In addition to that, Matt was named the NSCA's Assistant College Strength and Conditioning Coach of the Year. Prior to Denver, he worked at his alma mater, Boston University, as an assistant strength coach. He graduated from BU with a BS in Health and Science, as well as a Master's in Physical Education and Coaching from BU. He did six internships. The guy has paid his dues. He is hungry to learn he's going to take us through how they have built a phenomenal program sports performance program at the university of denver using their resources on campus and within their athletic department it's a fascinating interview here we go with matt shaw I want to just start this episode off by just talking about how Matt and I met. It was through Mike Boyle when Matt was interning at Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning. And I had Mike on the show probably three episodes ago. So it just goes to show how relationships work. Matt introduced me. Mike introduced me to Matt. And let me tell you, folks, when I was a director of sports performance, I had just got the job at Purdue. I was going after Matt Shaw so hard. You talk about recognizing the fact that this guy was a rising star in the profession as evidenced by the fact that he was named the Assistant Strength and Conditioning Coach of the Year by the National Strength and Conditioning Association in 2016. So I wasn't too far off point, but I was going after him and Matt and I developed a great relationship through the process. We probably would talk, what, three to four times a week? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, three to four times a week, hour or two at a time. (laughs) Oh, man, I I was in it. I was enamored by how sharp he was and we just developed a great relationship along the way and we continue to have a really good relationship. I bounce ideas off of him all the time with respect to training and it's just been a joy. So Matt, why don't you fill in the gaps and tell us a little bit about your journey in the strength and conditioning field? Yes, mine was a little bit different. Um, You know, I was never a college athlete, um, but I was, you know, athletic throughout my high school years. You know, I got my my athletic background was all in swimming and water polo and a little bit in men's lacrosse. Um, and so I originally lived in St. Louis and then halfway through high school, uh, my parents dropped the bomb that we're going to be moving out to Boston. Um, so I ended up finishing high school out in Boston. And then, you know, really that, that kind of, I think, ended up pushing me towards my degree path at Boston University. Um, so when I arrived at Boston U, um, I really was actually starting out professionally within athletic training and pursuing physical therapy um, in, a, in a joint program. And I think in my first year, I mean, my first semester, I was taking organic chemistry and a lot of classes that I think, you know, at the time I, I kind of started to realize maybe this wasn't the path that I wanted to go and that it ended up being very reactive in terms of healthcare and, and waiting for individuals to get injured. And it ended up pushing me actually to look at a completely different setting. And that was more along the lines of personal training and strength conditioning. And, you know, I was really lucky enough to have, you know, an individual in the community that, you know, at the time I was actually working at, you know, an athletic facility on the South shore in Boston um, after my first year of college. And she ended up, you know, guiding me a little bit and saying, you know, there's a really great strength coach, you know, at Boston U that you should reach out to. Um, and it just so happened to be Mike Boyle. Um, so I ended up interning with him in the men's ice hockey program um, back in 2006. And then from there, 
you know, just continued my path and trying, I think, learn from as many different individuals with different backgrounds and really a diverse group of mentors that I could. So, you know, with the Athletic Enhancement Center, which was joint strength and conditioning and sports psychology, more in a private um, sector, um, and it was actually out of the track and field center at BU. Um, and then ended up with BU's varsity athletic programs over at Harvard for eight months. Um, interning with Coach Frazier and, and Mullen. Um, and that was great, you know, to be able to look at you know, an Ivy League institution that has the largest athletic department in the country uh, with, I think it's 40 or 42 sports. Um, and to get that type of experience amongst the staff, I think it was a full time staff of three individuals. And, you know, from there, it ended up uh, leading into my grad assistantship at Boston U. And halfway through that, you know, made my way down to uh, South Carolina to intern with Coach Fitzgerald uh, with, with football and getting SEC football experience and then finishing up my, my GA position at BU. Um, so for me, educationally, I actually changed, I think, how I was approaching things. I tried to create as much diversity in my background as humanly possible because I liked that people had differentiating philosophies their methodologies were different but what I started to realize was the more I think that those experiences were different the more that it started to shape my personal you know philosophy and, and what I wanted to do and and working with athletes and those attributes that maybe made them unique or their strengths um, I started to gravitate to and to seeing how I could apply you know their success within a different context and in, in, in my future. So let's let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. After BU, you landed a position at Denver University, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I worked okay. for BU full time for one year. Yep, that's right. Um, and then you know an opportunity came. I actually got a phone call at the time, um, and you know they kind of gauged my interest about coming out and interviewing for the the position to oversee DU ice hockey women's soccer, men's soccer, both golf teams and diving. Um, so I had six teams of oversight. Um, you know, I could kind of have the, the availability to really start an internship program from the ground up. Um, and, you know, previously it was something that interested me because, you know, I'd gone through six unpaid internships and I realized how big of an impact that, that was going to make, you know, on the, on the future strength coaches um, to come. So if I could take those experiences and apply it um, within, I think, a different educational type, type of organization with, at DU, um, make a really positive impact for, for younger coaches like myself. So let's unpack that for a second. Six yep. teams at BU. Six teams plus you were doing the internship program. Yeah. Yep. Now, let's talk about how you were able to manage all those teams and be able to deliver excellence at a high level. Let's, let's share that with, share that with us. <laughs> yeah. Like, like anything, I think that it starts with the organization. I mean, you, you have to be on top of, you know, the simplistic, but effective methodologies. And I, I think it's the same thing, whether it's via programming or via coaching, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And I think that what we started with was really a simplistic layout behind what we're going to do, but it was going to be incredibly detailed and we were going to teach, you know, our athletes, um, educationally, really how to take control over their own lifestyle, how to take control over their own technique and apply things, you know, I think across the board, you know, the one thing that I think really makes an impact is educating athletes. Um, it's the one thing that, it's always consistent. They can take that knowledge. They can apply it in different ways. Um, and the more that we started to challenge athletes at DU behind taking control over their own recovery, taking control within their lifestyle in the college um, world and environment, the more that we started to see that, you know, the training really started to improve. They started to take control, uh, I think, at a higher level than, you know, we, we had seen in the past. And it started to evolve into something really unique. Well, tell me this, it's always a challenge to get college students to take ownership of things such as recovery. What were some of your strategies that you guys employed in order to make that happen? Yeah, we're incredibly fortunate. We actually have a, it's a, about a 50 person screening room right behind our offices within the weight room. 
Um, so we would do nutrition presentations. We would talk about recovery as it relates to the resources that we had on campus, either with, if it was in dining halls and the nutrition there, or whether it was individuals that were cooking for themselves away from campus. Uh, we talked about, you know, what was being offered resource wise within the sports medicine facility and how to integrate it, you know, both within timing as well as specifically the methods that were going to be used throughout, you know, th their college lifestyle. And so in between practices, in between class, what that looked like pre or post competition, um, how to handle things traveling. Um, so I think it was about applying things with context. You know, the more that you make it appropriate for the athlete to really understand, you know, what they're going to be going through, what they're going to have available to them, you know, and how those things constantly change based on their environment, the more that I think they start to realize that they can take control over those areas um, continuously, you know, whether they're at home, whether they're on the road, um, whether, you know, somebody that has limited resources or somebody that maybe has a little bit more financial resources, um, they can all find resources and apply them based on what they were trying to do. And it worked out really, really well and so, kept growing. So now there's all different scenarios. Yeah. With the respective athletes, sports and so forth. But let, let's pick a, let's pick a person and walk us through what that might look like in terms of how they went about incorporating, integrating some of these recovery strategies and the big picture things that you guys tried to do to help promote them or help promote them being a healthy, healthy athlete and optimizing their performance. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we started with nutrition. Nutrition for us was the one that had the highest frequency or dosage um, throughout the day. Nutrition, you know, within the dining hall, I think it was always an issue. So we actually started actually by just basic nutrition education. We have one consultant at DU. Uh, we didn't have a full-time staff member. So Really, when we got there, it was let's start by getting sports medicine and the sports performance staff involved with the education of our athletes. So we started there. Then we started to look at resources across campus using our food provider, you know, and so we talked with Sodexo. You know, we started, I think, a project that involved, you know, them redesigning a menu within actually one of their dining halls on campus, um, specifically to match up with you know, almost like a training table-esque um, design. So better carbohydrate options, better lean proteins and foods, fruits, vegetables. Um, and then we really attacked, I think, you know, the timing behind food and nutrient uptake and giving, you know, kids, you know, resources such as, you know, shopping lists. We talked about grocery store and like the psychology behind perimeter shopping talked about, you know, how nutrition played an impact in almost every physical physiological action within their body, but specifically with, you know, the things that they felt were relevant. So, you know, whether it was sleep and potentially like magnesium intake or timing behind, you know, things such as carbohydrate um, or making an impact in terms of, you know, the nutrition relative to what their goals were um, physically those things immediately created that psychological connection and, and it drove really them to be more invested into those areas. Awesome. Awesome. So nutrition was one component. Give me yep. another one. Yeah. So another one I think was looking at additional resources that we we're providing within sports medicine. So, you know, things like recovery pants, Norma tech. So the compression or the compression and passive recovery techniques, contrast bathing, uh, which I think is still something that we're a little bit limited on, but it's continuing to improve as locker rooms are getting redone and we're getting, you know, walk in, walk out, contrast tubs. Um, you know, we've, I think, had a really high level investment now from teams and approached all of our sports staffs about individually providing travel kits. So putting together self myofascial release tools. Um, you know, things such as rad or using basics such as lacrosse balls, foam rollers that we could travel with, um, stretch cords, bands, things that we could easily put together with one team, travel continually with and have access to on the field or in hotel rooms. Um, and even talked with coaches about, you know, how they even structure recovery time in on the road and, and making sure that, you know, if we're using you know, a conference room for video, that's another resource that our athletes can use for doing, you know, soft tissue based sessions on the road, 
uh, making sure that it's actually structured within their, their weekly schedule um, so that they understand the timing about when it's most appropriate um, and making sure that even if they're flying in and arriving, that it's an immediate priority. Outstanding. Outstanding. Now, at Denver, I'm yep. sure the resources aren't such that you can go and spend and, and purchase anything that you want to, like a, some Big Ten institutions. Yeah. And it, we've gotten creative. Okay. Yeah. That's what creative. I hear. That's what I hear. Yeah. That's what I hear. That's what I love. Yeah. So, you know, it's been interesting. Over the last few years, we actually created a collaboration called Pioneer Health and Performance. Um, and about three years ago, we took sports performance, sports psychology, sports nutrition, and sports medicine, and basically take, took those resources and those departments and really put them underneath one collaborative approach. When we did that, we also had immediate administrative support behind everything from technology initiatives um, to staffing increases long term. So, you know, immediately we actually created a fellowship program within our department. You know, we, we created a stipend position that allowed, you know, almost like a paid internship program to occur um, where we could give individuals an opportunity to receive non-academic money, uh, but still work part time while going through an education curriculum overseen by myself. Um, and working with maybe one or two teams and assisting with others, so almost like a, a GA position. Um, then we started to look at technology. We had our coaches came together and we fundraised money for Gym Aware, Catapult, um, different polar heart rate monitoring systems. And a lot of that was because we, we grouped coaches together that had like-minded goals within their programs. We took you know, really our, our biggest, you know, fundraisers and our investors that are, are assisting with our sports programs and said, you know, if, if we have multiple coaches that are all really trying to make an improvement with, you know, resources, can we all come together and can we purchase, you know, gym aware and can we use this across every single student athlete that we have at DU and make a really big impact from monitoring? Um, can we make an impact in terms of the methodologies that we're doing? Um, and so those things allowed us to continually expand just by getting, I think, sport coaches really involved yeah. with even supporting our department financially and gathering resources. I mean, we, we used, you know, like an app that was really inexpensive it was HRV for training. Um, I was just introduced to it within the last six or seven months. Um, and it's an unbelievable resource to do heart rate variability work via an athlete's iPhone um, and so that, you know, immediately prompts them first thing when they wake up, they, they take their heart rate variability using their phones and the camera and the, and the light on their phone almost acts as a pulse oximeter and measures that out. Um, and then there's immediately a subjective questionnaire. So now we have, you know, gymnastics, hockey, soccer, lacrosse, all creating access behind monitoring subjective questionnaires on a daily basis that allows us to further monitor, you know, those teams with some of the other resources that we have. And it's, and it's relatively very inexpensive. And when we say us, let, let's dial it back a little bit. Tell us a little yeah. bit about your progression in terms of your, in terms of the positions that you've held yeah. since in your seven years at DU. Yeah. And then how the staff has expanded over that time and a little bit about your role as a director of sports performance. Yeah. So, so when I first arrived at DU, I came in as really the head assistant. So there was only three full-time staff members for about 17 sports teams. Um, within my first year, we established the, the internship program. And our goal was really to provide, I think, a really unbelievable curriculum and education um, to give interns not only the academic education that they needed to be successful within um, their internship and, and within their future within the profession, but also to give them a ton of hands-on experience, uh, you know, to get them immediately involved with everything that they were, we were doing on a consistent basis, whether it was warmups, whether it was individual training sessions, whether it was, you know, small group training or rehab, we wanted them to immediately get those hands-on experiences that was really going to allow them to shape who they were as not only, I think, a practitioner and what they're doing programming wise, but also as a coach and giving them that direct feedback about how they interact with individuals, how they lead um, teams. 
and then what we did was we continued to progress, you know, our department. And like I said, within, when we actually established pioneer health and performance, um, we, you know, we knew that we had the support administratively to bring in two additional part-time staff members. So that brought us from three full-time staff members and then up to two additional part-time staff members. Um, so now we're, we're still in that same type of setting, but you know, we've really, I think, continued to evolve our, our education. So every year we take a critical look at what we're doing educationally with interns and then our separate education route with our fellows and making sure that it's aligning with, I think, the progression of the field, making sure that we're exposing them to sports science integration and monitoring, uh, making sure that they're being kept up to date with you know, some of the more interesting methodologies and, and practices out there. Now, let's talk a little bit about your role now as a director. Yeah. What's that look like? Oh, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Um, yeah, so, so it's, been, it's been interesting. You know, when I first started, um, you know, as the head strength coach here, you know, I think the, the biggest obstacle that I ran up against was really defining what I wanted, you know, in terms of the future development of the department. You know, I, I knew that I, we had great staff members um, hiring individuals and the people that we were going to have on our full-time staff was really important. So finding people that I think that fit a really diverse coaching background, maybe strengths, weaknesses. Um, and we really established, I think, a group of individuals that all had very different backgrounds, um, but had a common desire to really deliver exceptional care and coaching to our student athletes, people that had a really, really high investment level. You know, as, as that evolved, I think we really started to, to define what we wanted to bring in in terms of resources. You know, we wanted to be a mid-major institution that was going to get creative, that we were, we we're going to bring in, you know, access, access to technology that I think maybe is a little bit uncommon, um, but we found a way to work with, you know, like I said, companies like catapult where we were actually taking 15 units on catapult and dividing it across four teams and rotating them, you know, those, those units, um, between the morning, mid morning, afternoon, and then evening practices. Um, so we, we found a way logistically to kind of get creative with what we were trying to accomplish and where we were going to try to drive the department. Uh, and, and the biggest thing for us was transparency and standards. The, the one thing that we were always going to say from day one is that what we're going to be delivering is going to be the best quality that we can possibly deliver, even though that we may be either financially limited or limited on total staffing. We were going to try to bring whatever possible energy and, and positivity and resourcefulness to the job that we could every single day. No. You mentioned you did five unpaid internships, plus you worked a full year at BU. Yeah. Give me a couple things that you learned while you were at those, while you were serving those positions, that when you became a director, you said, you know what, I got to implement this because I saw this in, during my path or along my path, that, and it was really, really successful. Yeah. Look, man, I, I had the best possible first internship. You know, under Mike Boyle with BU Hockey at the time, you know, the thing that I walked away from that internship realizing was that critical thinking was going to serve me for the rest of my career. My ability to look at things and to maybe challenge the norms of whether it was something that was just being presented or talked about within the field, or maybe if it was something that, you know, somebody was saying that fit really well or contextually within the collegiate environment. We were going to continue to ask, well, why does that work well? Or why doesn't it work well? And, and not just kind of follow the norm. Um, you know, the, we, we've kind of gone out and specifically, I think, looked at education such as like FRC and, you know, RPR, FNOR, which is functional neuroorthopedic rehabilitation. It's a big mouthful, but it's a, it's a chiropractic education um, resource. And, you know, within every single one of those educational systems, you know, they're built off of 20 years of research plus, you know, they have a ton of structure behind them. But in order to implement those bits and pieces within the college environment, we had to think critically about the areas that made sense and that we could deliver on a large scale team based approach and still be really effective. So there was natural 
I, I think adjustments made behind how we were going to structure it. And it wasn't just a blanket. Everyone's going to do everything. It was let's fit things based off of the population that we're serving based off of the individuals that we're working with and, and make sure that this is actually specific to the individual, the teams that we're really trying to look for in the long run. Mm, outstanding. Could you give me an example of, of how you've implemented? Yeah, yeah. R so, R you know, let's go RPR. Yeah, so like RPR for us is interesting. So two of our staff members currently were actually originally taught um, RPR or at the time it was Be Activated um, by Douglas Hill, the, the creator over in, you know, he's a South African manual therapist who then expanded into the United States. Um, and it was really interesting. When we went through that, you know, it's a series of tests, manual, you know, tests, that you actually look for the, the neuromuscular reactions off of you know isolated muscle testing, such as your hip flex or your glute. You look at breathing patterns. We try to almost like look for compensation patterns externally. And you know, to, in order to fit that within the college environment, you know, it couldn't be us manually working with with an individual and trying to rotate across 320 athletes continuously. So I think we kind of tiered out our approach. We, we said, all right, initially when we do this, and if we're going to start to do this within the college environment, we're going to bring an athletic trainer with us during the education round. So we actually flew out with two or three of our coaches, as well as one athletic trainer to immediately get sports medicine on board with that process. We came back, we sat down, thought critically about really where this really fits in within DU and within, I think, our goals as a department and, and the support staff. And we started to kind of like really write out what that looked like. So for us, it was team wise, we're going to teach individuals to do this really consistently, you know, as part of warm ups. we're going to structure their understanding and their knowledge base in appropriate to, I think, what they're going to go through, you know, on a day to day basis. So we want them to understand really how this fits in and creates opportunity for them to make change um, your muscularly before training, before practice, before competition. And, and then we were also going to figure out a way to still be able to test and to evaluate individuals. So we kind of figured out that, you know, for us, it was, if you're going to go through and you're going to test somebody and spend that time doing it, like we should be tracking where they're compensating from, whether they're, you know, running their jaw and compensating for the, for their hip flexor, or if it's an arm driver. Um, and so we started to kind of watch for those things and code those things out. Um, and it's been adjusted even since then where it's been streamlined to the point where, you know, we know that people need to clear those compensation patterns using RPR. That's the first thing they do in, you know, they do when they arrive within the facility. And then we go into a more generalized RPR, you know, reflex point clearance. Outstanding. Outstanding. Let me ask you this. Yep. You have a kid that comes into Dem Denver as a student athlete. They're a high school kid. They haven't started yet. What is your communication like with that kid? And then what's the expectations for that kid when they arrive on campus? And then how do you take them through? How do you take them from there? Yeah, it, this is a really important question for us because onboarding for us streamlines everything. You, you know, it, in, the, in the last year, we actually took um, our sports psychologist and created an onboarding process that involved them. Um, just because of the stress of changing environment, you know, it's the first time that an athlete is being asked to make decisions on their own. They have more resources than they've ever had. Um, they have to be able to, I think, emotionally and really function within the college environment differently than they're probably their past. So when we have athletes come in, you know, during the summer, this was the first time we did it was actually this past summer. The first thing we did was really meet with all the department heads of all the support teams. So myself and sports performance, we had them meet with, you know, our head of sports medicine, our sports psychologist, and we kind of created that process of, of education. You know, these are the resources that are available to you. You know, this is how we want you to communicate with coaches. You're going to go through adversity and we want you to have an open line of communication and also understanding maybe how to interact with coaches and, and making sure that you have the right resources. Um, and it really helped us, I think, streamline, you know, the process of, you know, taking, 
you know, really about a hundred incoming freshmen and really making sure that we're clarifying, you know, how we would like them to transition. What do you really has resource wise and how they can use those resources um, to fit within their goals or their healthcare. Um, and so it's the same thing kind of even internally within the department, our strength coaches really walk them through what our facility has resource wise. We start with developing routines, whether it's soft tissue work, whether it's, you know, mobility work or using, you know, some of the resources that we have access to within sports medicine, um, and on campus nutritionally. And so we start there and then just continually build out their education um, regarding training. Like we do whiteboard sessions sometimes before, you know, workouts. Uh, we'll do, you know, breakout or individual based, you know, group sessions regarding continuing education for nutrition. Uh, we're doing food logs. Um, so there's, I think all those things are geared towards just helping the athletes better understand the transition into the college environment and setting them up for success proactively. Now, you mentioned something earlier in the broadcast. You talked yeah. about giving athletes ownership. Ideally, what it sounds like I'm hearing is that when they get to that junior, senior year, you want them to be able to take the ball and run with it. Say, some, oh, yeah. say something about yeah. that. Yeah, it, it's been really interesting because we constantly drive, I think, self-efficacy. Um, is something my parents are both psychologists. So, you know, I had a really messed up youth. No, <laughs> um, I, it's something that's always been, I think, really important to me is that if we're going to teach somebody what this process looks like and, and creating stress and going through adversity, they also need to know how to apply things themselves. And the end of the day, we're trying to teach kids how to be professionals, not only within athletics, but also within life how to take care of their lifestyle away from, you know, the, the hours that they're being, you know, guided, you know, athletically or academically. And can they create the best case scenario for themselves to succeed? You know, and maybe that looks a little bit different for each individual. Maybe it's some kids that have aspirations for professional athletics. And we have a lot of those individuals, but then for others, they can take that knowledge of organization of how they're taking care of themselves physically and, and how the importance actually relates back into the business world. It gives them confidence in how they live their lives. And, you know, even you know, like an example, even like for men's soccer, you know, I don't even oversee their warm up during pregame. Um, at that time, they know how to warm themselves up. They know our routines and then they make individual decisions behind what dynamic mobility work that they need to do. Do they need to do additional, you know, ankle mobility work, or do they need to do additional warm up strategies that may look a little bit different than some other guys? So it's really about getting them to take ownership over the routines that are going to set them up for success. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I love the synergy. I love the fact that you guys are putting the onus on them at some point to be able to address some of the things that they may need specifically. That's just, that's awesome. Let's, let's shift gears here. Did you guys win a national championship last year? Yes, we, uh, it wasn't last year, it was two years ago. Two so years 2017, ago. we won the uh, hockey national championship. Wow. Yeah. 27. What was that experience like? Oh, it was a journey. <laughs> it, you know, I think when you talk about every season, a lot of, we've, we've had some unbelievable coaches at DU. Um, Jim Montgomery, who was the head hockey coach, um, just actually left DU this past um, summer um, and is now the head strength coach, uh, or sorry, the head uh, hockey coach for the uh, Dallas Stars. And- Little slip right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he, he, he's one of those guys that when you're around him, you realize how I think aware he is and emotionally intelligent of the team and guiding them throughout the entire length of a season towards one, one singular goal. You know, the one thing that's always gets talked about, I think across most teams is that it's a journey. It's a process And you know, that season for us, those two words were talked about more than probably anything else was that what we do on a day-to-day -day basis was going to create success. And then those little successes achieved each day, were going to add up and getting individuals to understand their own individual processes related to what they needed to individually achieve and their role within the team. Um, all of those things kind of kept being talked about, but you know, for us, it was, it was a journey because there, we had late season adversity and, 
you know, there, there was a time where it's like you learn from those, those moments and it makes a drastic impact on the remainder of that season. Well, tell us a little bit about something that you learned from a given moment, an adverse moment that changed the course and helped you guys elevate your performance. Yeah, I mean, I, I think at times we kind of get stuck in our own routines, you know, especially as coaches. You know, there's times where, you know, whether it's your thought process behind programming, whether it's our own awareness over, you know, the, the emotional side of coaching or motivating or, you know, how we, I think, go about our day, you know, the, for me, I, I remember specifically even like about a year and a half ago sitting down and saying like, I need to do a better job of supporting our coaches from the emotional management side. You know, there's, there's usually three to four sport coaches involved within a program and anywhere from 20 to 30 kids on a sports team. And in order for teams to really generate a ton of success, you need everyone bought into details, the role that they're playing within teams, um, their, their individual you know, mental state, whether it being positive, whether they're getting frustrated. And so you're talking I about think I started players, or co players or coach your sports performance staff. Yeah. So I'm talking about our sports performance staff actually interacting with okay. our players okay. and supporting, I think the common mission of our sports programs. And so that was a big piece. And I think I've even challenged our staff currently on this is that can we do a better job of actually tying in, you know, team goals or team missions, you know, and the things that are being discussed within team meetings with how it relates even into our environment and making sure that those things have consistency across both, you know, sport practice as well as within our environment. Because what we see, those two are the exact same. What comes out on the field is usually also what's occurring within the weight room. When, it, when a kid's getting frustrated or there's an adverse moment within the weight room, usually you see the exact same reactions and so is there something that we could be doing to help, I think, develop those type of either mental strategies or physical skills um, to help those kids succeed and, and deal with those things? It's, it's such an opportunity to, to really tie in the mental side of it and, and or the routine and lifestyle management piece um, across almost every environment. So then how did you guys seize the moment? How did you... As you go about yeah, I mean, for, for us, I think one, we, we always tell this to our interns, but the hardest thing I think is being self-aware. You know, you, you every, every single session that we run, I think our, our staff takes a step back and we self critique. We go through that critical thinking stage of, you know, where can we be better? Um, it's the same thing with at the end of the season. And so I think that, you know, the year before with hockey, we made it to a frozen four and we lost in, in the frozen four. And it was kind of a turning program or turning point for the program at the time. Um, it was the first time we had been back to the frozen four, I think since we had won, you know, the, the last national championship in 2005. Um, and that left a sting and a level of motivation within our team that was unique, but it was something that needed to be talked about and then driven in the right way. So starting in the off season, it was about immediately addressing you know, this is where our shortcomings were and being transparent of behind that. And, you know, can we make change as a team in the off season? And then can we continually take those changes to how we are approaching our practices um, in season and our consistency? I mean, it, those things, I think it's always an evolution of the experiences of what kids go through across their freshman, sophomore, junior and senior year. But that was a big moment was just seeing that amount of adversity and going all that way and then losing um, because of one moment of lack of detail, you know, within the team. And guys realized that they need to change their details. They need to find consistency day in, day out, whether it's within practice, within the weight room. Um, and it brought us up an entire another level as a program. So tell me this. What was your communication like with your previous head coach? especially during this championship run, your day-to-day -day interaction with him? What were things that he wanted to know from you? What were things that you would share with him, things that you saw? Did you have that freedom to be able to do that? Did he listen? Talk to us yeah. a little bit about those things. Well, I'll be honest and very transparent. I'm incredibly blessed to have, I think, you know, head coaches that are so supportive of our environment and what we do. Coach Montgomery, you know, during that time, all the assistant coaches, you know, they, they, I think they understand that I'm probably around their kids more so than probably anybody else. 
And the lessons that we teach them, the results that we've gotten have kind of played into that, building that trust and that relationship over time. And, you know, whether it's, you know, with Catapult and educating them regarding, hey, this is what we're seeing from practice structure. Can we make an adjustment here? Or this is what we're trying to achieve out of our weekly stress and how it should undulate leading into games or, or into the weekend. You know, they, they were incredibly open minded about it. Um, and it takes a while to get to that point, but I think, you know, our relationship was strong enough that it allowed us to be completely transparent. And the other side of it, I think was, you know, we would touch base you know, almost every day about, you know, where certain individuals were, where we could make, you know, a little adjustment based off of helping, you know, support a kid, whether it's mentally or physically, or maybe resting a kid from in practice here or there. Um, those conversations were happening and, and it was great because it allowed us to make adjustments to, to travel schedules and what we were going to be doing on the road. It allowed us to make adjustments within practices, um, but just giving them information, even for helping them better structure or get more out of practices without increasing training stress. Um, that, that was really important. Outstanding. Outstanding. Now, there's a lot of new toys on the market coming out all the time at lightning fast speed, no pun intended, <laughs> with respect to sports science. There's a lot of stuff out there. Yep. Give me your top three go-tos and why. Oh, man, I think our top three right now are probably the ones that we have. Um, look, the, the HRV for training app for us has been incredibly um, easy in terms of access. The athletes can take the heart rate variability first thing in the morning on their phones um, every single kid can do it. It's cheap um, across an entire team. It's very easy to use. Um, you know, the, I think the customer support out of it is great. Um, you know, for us, that would be one, How, two, I think. Okay, hold on. How are yeah. you using that? So yeah. first, first off, why are you looking at heart rate variability? And secondly, how are you using yeah. that data? Yeah, so heart rate variability, I think, is a great way to get a snapshot of whether somebody is sympathetic or parasympathetic. Um, you know, we use it, it's every single day once the team's up and running on it. And so we're getting a consistent internal metric of where they're kind of at from, from their, their response to the vagus nerve. Um, the nice thing about that though, is it's not just an internal metric because right when they get done taking it, there's like a 30 second subjective questionnaire. So now we have subjective, you know, feelings and results matched with internal, um, re really responses to stress. And so we, for the amount of time that it takes, you're looking at a minute and a half, two minutes right in the morning to get this done it's awesome to have that type of consistency and feedback and be able to get that information to our coaches about how individuals are doing, how they're trending. Uh, and like I said, the customer support's great. Like they've made it really easy to, whether you're pulling CSV files and doing fancy work with it, or whether you want to just use their web-based platform. Um, it's really easy to look at correlations behind information, look at trends, um, and to manage multiple teams or groups off of it. Outstanding. Okay. Number two. Okay. Number two, I think for us, um, we got, let's say it probably is about eight months in that for us is gym aware. Um, gym aware has been really, really interesting for us because I think we've tried to get really creative with how we use it. Um, you know, in season we're using it to auto regulate, obviously based off of velocity. So if somebody's coming in tired on a day, you know, this, we just set either, a, you know, a threshold or a range behind their velocity, and then they can manipulate their load to make sure that they're within that range. For those who don't, um, for those who don't know what gym aware is, you want to give a little yeah. background on gym aware. Yeah. So gym aware is essentially, it's a velocity based measurement tool using an iPad on a rack. And it just uses kind of like a tethered string to really measure bar velocity and measure <laughs> <laughs> measure bar velocity and to give you other bits of feedback such as displacement of the bar. So like height or depth that you're, you're actually moving at. Um, you can also look at wattage or your output. So it actually has this, a bunch of different metrics that you can look at. Um, I think you know, when we make decisions about investing into technologies, the other thing that I think comes into mind is how 
diverse that we can use that technology. So when we purchased gym aware, it wasn't just to auto regulate, um, you know, what the athletes were doing in season or to make sure that they're moving at a certain speed. It also was going to be to set up, you know, an additional evaluation evaluatory tool. So we actually are starting to use gym aware to measure, um, things such as like our vertical jump in, because Jimware actively records everything all one time, we can look at both their vertical jump displacement uh, by inches, but we could also look at the velocity at which they're actually moving. So we're getting information now that can actually kind of guide um, your training methodologies in, on an individual basis to a higher extent than just taking somebody's displacement like vertical jump. So when looking at the velocity yep. that they're jumping at, using the gym aware, are you using that to look at neuromuscular fatigue as well? Yeah. So we're going to eventually probably get into that, but right now, um, you know, the nice thing about it is that so we have six gym aware units. So on any given day, we'll actually probably end up structuring this in warm ups. So if somebody's warming up on squat, they'll actually probably have a set warm up profile that they need to hit continuously every single time. So we can actually just look at the comparison of, you know, the, that warm up um, and, and the varying velocities week to week or day to day, uh, more so than maybe moving it from jump to squat to multiple exercises where it really complicates the training environment and, and how effective that you can be. But you can absolutely use gym aware um, from that standpoint, looking at how velocity changes or decreases. Um, you could use it to measure, you know, preset what your jump is and then maybe post set how much fatigue's created across like there's a lot of varying ways that you can use it and that was one of the reasons why we actually looked at that as a as a technology that we wanted to have outstanding number three. Oh man i, I, I uh, hear number three you've said you've said uh, uh gps system there yeah yeah catapult, catapult for us definitely yeah. uh um, why did i draw a blank on catapult Ooh. All right. <laughs> Catapult for us definitely has been a game changer. Um, when you're able to take a team, put them through a practice and actually start to quantify not just the loads and what they're experiencing stress wise across the entire practice, but even more importantly, what they're experiencing by drill, it allows you to really, I think, inform your coaches at a higher level. When we first, um, you know, really signed our contract with Catapult, we actually looked at that as being one of the biggest priorities. Can we take Catapult and can we actually start creating, you know, a system of education behind, you know, this is you know, drill stress that, that our sport coaches are selecting. So every single drill that we actually complete within hockey practice or soccer practice ends up being recorded. And we take that normative data and we end up, then creating just a spreadsheet on like what drills to elicit a really high training stress across, you know, whether it's high speed running or high uh, force skating, um, which, which drills elicit the highest player load per minute or trim per minute. So it's actually allowing, you know, us to get that, those density measures that then we can say, you know, this is really what we're trying to look for in terms of practice structure. Can we start with exercises or drills that are more, CNS or speed based and keep it high quality. And then as practice transitions later on, get into some of our higher work capacity based drills, our battling drills, things that elicit more of a metabolic demand and really try to leverage, you know, the quality of what every practice looks like. Outstanding. I keep saying that because it's just good stuff. Now, we're going to close with two questions here. What do you do to educate yourself to continue to raise your level? Over the last few years, I think I've relied on resources in the community probably more than ever. What I mean by that is, you know, we're really lucky within, within the city of Denver to have some really unbelievable practitioners. Um, down the road from us is Dr. Nick Studholm. He's one of the best chiropractors I've ever been around. Um, he's an internal consultant for our sports medicine group, as well as our sports performance department. And, you know, a few years back, so he's, he's a grand institute fellow. So he actually went through the same education route as Todd Wright. Um, and so I really started to gravitate towards, you know, can, can we have conversations and shared, 
um, education behind, you know, really what you're doing on your side, because he was actually taking normal chiropractic work, but then integrating three dimensional movement and in a training, like almost like a motor control training period after those chiropractic um, adjustments or whether what he's doing, you know, with, with different tissue work um, to really create long-term motor control change. So we were looking at like neuroplasticity and motor control behavioral changes. Um, and so we started to actually talk and have those conversations about how those things then translate back over into the college environment. You know, and so I think it's about using what's available to you. Um, another example would be, you know, our mechanical engineering department at DU. You know, when I first arrived at DU, um, was really fortunate enough to meet uh, one of our mechanical engineers um, who's actually operating a force plate lab um, within the, the DU athletic major facility. And we were super lucky to have it available to us at that time because um, it provided an opportunity for us to actually get involved with our own research. So we were doing thoracic outlet syndrome research for swimming. Uh, we got hockey involved with a three-dimensional and neuromuscular um, evaluation on, on how our our training methods were transferring within, you know, lateral and rotational based force output. Um, so specifically measures that would really apply, I think the most over to their on ice skating. Um, you know, we've got a lot of teams now that have gotten involved and it's helped drive our own understanding of, you know, what we're doing on a consistent basis, whether it's evaluating our athletes differently, whether it's using resources on campus or within the community to a different extent, uh, but it's all about leveraging what's available to you and not trying to recreate the wheel or try to do th things that are just outside of, you know, wh what's possible. But, you know, we, we got really creative doing that and it's paid off huge dividends. Now, what would Matt Shaw in 2018, what would he tell his younger self, your director at this point, what would you tell your younger self to, to, help you become even better than where you are now? If you knew X, what would you tell yourself? What would that be? What would that X be? Knowing the ADD in me, I would probably say the biggest thing that I've had to learn as a director is time management, um, work-life balance, and being as efficient as possible within the workplace. You know, I, I got married a year ago. Congrats, um, congrats. You know, I promised, <laughs> I promised my wife that I would do everything possible to continually like manage, you know, our lifestyle to make sure that it wasn't 98% work and 2%, you know, the relationship, but finding really creative ways just to, I think, manage time and make sure that I was getting home at the right hour. I was efficient as possible and getting work done in the office. And I think part of that, you know, really, I think it forced me to take a look at even how I was programmed. You know, I think younger strength coaches get kind of caught up of completely like trying to reinvent the wheel every single year, starting from scratch, writing brand new programs every single time and started to take a look at program and to say, all right, at the end of every single phase, I'm going to make a critical assessment of how that phase went and I'm going to adjust what I didn't like about it, but keep the, keep the normal framework and, and just tweak it every single time that we do those things. And then instead of, you know, trying to reinvent the wheel the next year, can I take that framework and then can I just tweak that program a little bit maybe to, to reach a different individual or group? So now my Excel files really get divided almost in like a tiered way. So every single time that I write a phase, it's, you know, I may have a freshman card that may have a slightly different exercise um, selection or regression off certain things or an individual card that has those same things. But then I may have like a level two, a level three, you know, training stress that gets more into complex training methodologies. And so what I've almost done is created like a four year progression behind programming, but I've just done it slowly over time and, and really evolving things at a, at a natural rate and critically thinking about what we can do to do things better, but it, doing it efficiently, not, not starting from scratch every single time or thinking that it needs to be changed. Cause I am a firm believer that what's on paper can continuously be adjusted 
and, and manage based off of the circumstances. And every single year, you're going to have different circumstances. Sure. So it's more about my flexibility as a coach or as a practitioner to just make those adjustments as I see fit every single day. You know, I, I talk to our interns all the time about, you know, even if you write a program and you're in the middle of implementing it, just because it's on paper doesn't mean you can't hold up a stop sign and make adjustments to something based off of what an athlete's going through in terms of practice stress or competition, or maybe they're in finals period. It's like, you, you got to work on the fly sometimes. And those are the, like the biggest impacts that I think I've made within programming or, you know, can I write a framework and have flexibility within that framework, but then still individually just manage athletes according to what they're experiencing. Well, for those out there that are listening, you probably understand full and well why I was trying to go after this guy and why I was put full court press in trying to get Matt Shaw as part of my team. This has been an outstanding podcast. I'm sure those who are listening are going to get a tremendous amount of nuggets from this and hopefully it will help, help them shape their career and improve in certain aspects of the career. I want to thank you, Matt. And here's one question. I know I, this is a little lie. <laughs> my last question. It hit I, me with it. Yeah, I hope that when you said that you're, you're adjusting or you're, you're addressing your work-life balance with your wife and it's not 98% Wait, 98% work and 2% her. I hope yeah. that you don't put her on a treadmill while you're training people and say, hey, huh, you know, we spent <laughs> yeah, time, I mean, to, I we just, spent I time together. I her to come around with me all the time, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, look, again, thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate you, and good luck this year. Hopefully you guys will get that, that next national championship and the soccer team will get to the Final Four and win a championship. Thanks a lot, Matt. No, I, I appreciate it. Thanks, Dwayne. It was amazing to hear Matt Shaw's perspective on how he has built the program at the University of Denver. He acknowledges it, that it hasn't been by himself. He's gone cross campus into various departments to solicit their expertise to help the student athletes. He's rallied the various departments within the athletic department and brought them together on one accord to serve the student athletes. He truly has a servitude heart. His passion to want to learn is driven by simply providing a level of excellence to the student athletes to help them perform at their optimal level, not only during their tenure at University of Denver, but also beyond. One of the critical things that Matt said among the many that really, really just sticks out to me is how they have been able to do more with less. They simply find a way to get it done. They've been limited in terms of their resources, but yet the university has got on board and has added positions to the, to the charge. And the student athletes are the ones that are benefiting from it. Matt Shaw, a force in the field. Very, very thankful for you being on the show. And I also want to thank you for listening. If you're a young strength coach out there or just an aspiring strength and conditioning professional who's a high school kid that wants to get into the field, listen to the path that he took. It certainly shows that you can get there. Nevertheless, it'll be hard work. And Matt rolls his sleeves up. I know he's a guy that, that constantly gets it done. So again, thank you for listening. Please, if you like the show, subscribe as well as review the show. It would be very, very helpful. If you know athletes out in the Bay Area that want to get faster, quicker, stronger, more explosive, get ready for their upcoming season, please refer them to Carlisle Performance Systems. In the meantime, in between time, thank you and have a great day.